Sanctified, Caesarian, Catholic Majesty, the Emperor Don Carlos, our Lord King. Most eminent majesty from this city of Mexico, capital of New Spain, this All Souls Day of the year of our Lord, 1529. Greeting. In sending, at your majesty's behest, yet another increment of the Aztec history. This necessarily obedient, but still reluctant servant begs leave to quote various Geminis on an occasion when he approached his emperor with some vexata quasitio. Whoever dares speak before thee, O Caesar, knows not thy greatness. Whoever dares not speak before thee knows not thy goodness. Though we may risk giving affront and receiving rebuke, we beseech you, sire, that we may be granted permission to abandon this noxious enterprise. Inasmuch as your majesty has recently read, in the previous portion of manuscript delivered into your royal hands, the Indians' bland and almost blithe confession of having committed the abominable sin of incest, an act prescribed throughout the known world, civilized and savage alike, an act execrated even by such degenerate peoples as the Basques, the Greeks, and the English, an act forbidden even by the meager lex non scripta observed by the Indians' own fellow barbarians, therefore an act not to be condoned by us because it was committed before the sinner had any knowledge of Christian morality. For all these reasons, we had confidently expected that your pious majesty would be sufficiently appalled to order an immediate end to the Aztec's oratory, if not to the Aztec himself. However, your majesty's loyal cleric has never yet disobeyed a command from our liege. We append the further pages collected, since the last were sent. And we will keep the scribes and the interpreter at their enforced and odious occupation, setting down still further pages, until such time as our most esteemed emperor may see, see fit to give them surcease. We only beg and urge, sire, that when you have read this next segment of the Aztec's life history, since it contains passages that would sicken Sodom, your majesty will reconsider your command that this chronicle be continued. That the pure illumination of our Lord Jesus Christ always guide the ways of your majesty is the devout wish of your SCCM's devoted missionary legate. Ece Signum, Sumaraga. At the time of which I have been speaking, when I was given the name of Mole, I was still in school. Every sundown, when the working day was done, I and all the other boys above seven years of age, from all the villages and residences of Shaltakan, went either to the house of building strength, or, boys and girls together, to the house of learning manners. In the former school, we boys endured rigorous physical exercises, and were taught the ball game of Tlactli and the rudiments of handling battle weapons. In the latter school, we and the girls our age were given some sketchy history of our nation and other lands, some rather more intensive instruction in the nature of our gods and the numerous festivals dedicated to them, and were taught the arts of ritual singing dancing, and playing of musical instruments for the celebration of all those religious ceremonies. It was only in those Telpakultin, or lower schools, that we commoners mingled as equals with the children of the nobility, and even with a few of the demonstrably brighter and more deserving slave children. That elementary education, stressing politeness, piety, grace, and dexterity, was regarded as sufficient schooling for us middle-class youngsters, and a real honor for the handful of slave children who were deemed worthy and capable of any schooling whatever. 
But none of the slave boys, and few of us middle class boys, and never a girl child, even a daughter of the nobility, could look forward to any further education than that provided by the house of manners and strength. The sons of our nobles usually left the island to attend one of the Kelmacacton, since there was no such school on Sheltican. Those institutions of higher learning were staffed and taught by a special order of priests, and their students learned to be priests themselves, or to be governing officials, or scribes, historians, artists, physicians, or professionals of some other calling. Entrance to a Kalamakag was not forbidden to any ordinary boy, but the attendance and boarding there was too costly for most middle-class families to afford, unless a boy was accepted at no cost at all for having shown great distinction in the lower school. And I must confess that I distinguished myself not at all in either the house of learning manners or that of building strength. I remember on my first entering the music class at the School of Manners. The master of the boys asked me to sing something, so they, that he might judge the quality of my voice. And I did, and he did, saying, A wondrous thing to hear, but I do not believe it is singing. We will try you on an instrument. When I proved equally incapable of reading a tune from the four-hold flute, or any kind of harmony from the various tuned drums, the exasperated master put me into a class which was learning one of the beginner's dances, the Thundering Serpent. Each dancer makes a small spring forward with a stamping noise, then whirls completely around, crouches on one knee, and turns again in that position then makes another stamping forward leap. When a line of boys and girls does this in progression, the sound is of a continuous rolling boom, and the visual effect is that of a lawn snake twining its way along in sinuous curves. Or it should be. This is the first thundering serpent I ever saw with a kink in it, shouted the mistress of the girls. Get out of that line, Malinqui, shouted the master of the boys. Thereafter, to him, I was Malinqui, the kink. And thereafter, when our school's students performed in public, at festival ceremonies in the island's Pyramid Plaza, my only contribution to the music and dancing was to beat a turtle-shell drum with a pair of small deer antlers or to click a pair of crab claws in each hand. Fortunately, my sister maintained the honor of our family at those events, she being always the featured solo dancer. Tsitsitlini could dance without any music at all, yet make the spectators believe they heard music all about them. I was beginning to feel that I possessed no identity at all, or else so many that I knew not which to accept as really my own. At home I had been Meechley, the cloud. To the rest of Sheltakan, I was becoming generally known as Tozani, the mole. At the house of learning manners, I was Malinqui, the kink. And in the house of building strength, I soon became Poyatla, the fog-bound. By good fortune, I was not as lacking in muscle as in musical bent, for I had inherited my father's stature and solidity. By the time I was fourteen, I was taller than schoolmates two years older, and I suppose a stone-blind man could do the stretching and leaping and weightlifting exercises. So the master of athletics found no fault with my performance until we began to engage in team sports. If the game of Tlactli allowed the use of hands and feet, I might have played better, for one moves one's hands and feet almost instinctively. 
but the hard ollie ball can be struck only with knees, hips, elbows, and buttocks. And when I could see the ball at all, it was only a dim blob, further blurred by its speed. Consequently, though we players wore head protectors, hip girdles, knee and elbow sleeves of heavy leather, and thick cotton padding over the rest of our bodies, I was constantly being bruised by the blows of the ball. Worse, I could seldom distinguish my own teammates from the opposing players. When I did infrequently knee or hip the ball, I was as likely as not to slam it through the wrong one of the squat stone arches, the knee-high goals, which, according to the complicated rules of the game, are continually being lugged from place to place at the ends of the court. As for putting the ball through one of the vertical stone rings high up in the midline of the court's two enclosing walls, meaning an immediate win, no matter what the score of goals already made by either team, that is next to impossible for even the most experienced player to do, even by accident. It would have been a miracle for fog-bound me. It was not long before the Master of Athletics gave up on me as a participant. I was put in charge of the player's water jar and dipper, and of the pricking thorns and sucking reeds with which, after each game, the school physician eased the stiffness of the players by drawing the turgid black blood from their bruises. Then there were the war games and the weapons instruction, under the tutelage of an elderly and scarred Quachek, an old eagle, the title of one whose battle valor has already been proved. His name was Etchley Kwani, or Blood Glutton, and he must have been well over forty years old. For those exercises, we boys were not allowed to wear any of the plumes or paints or other array of real warriors. But we carried boy-sized shields of wood or wicker covered with leather, and we wore boy sized suits of the soldier's standard battle garb. Those garments were of thickly quilted cotton, toughened by having been soaked in brine, and they covered us from neck to wrists and ankles. They allowed a reasonable freedom of movement, and they were supposed to protect us from arrows, at least those arrows propelled from a distance. But I, ah, they were hot and scratchy and sweaty things to wear for longer than a short while. First you will learn the battle cries, said Blood Glutton. In combat, of course, you will be accompanied by the conch trumpeters and the beaters of the thunder drums or the groaning drums. But to those must be added your own voices shouting for slaughter and the sound of your fists and weapons pounding upon your shields. I know from experience, my boys, that an overwhelming clamor of noise can be a weapon itself. It can shake a man's mind, water his blood, weaken his sinews, even void his bladder and bowels. But you must make that noise, and you will find it twice effective. It heartens your own battle resolve, while it terrifies your enemy. And so, for weeks before we held even a mock weapon, we yelled the shrieks of the eagle, the rasping grunts of the jaguar, the long-drawn hoots of the owl, the alalala of the parrot. We learned to caper in feigned eagerness for battle, to menace with broad gestures, to threaten with grimaces, to pound our shields in drumming unison until they were stained with the blood of our hands. Some other nations had weapons different from those we Mexica relied on, and some of our own units of warriors were equipped with arms for particular purposes, and even an individual might choose always to use whichever weapon he had become most proficient with. Those, uh, those other arms included the leather sling for throwing rocks, 
the blunt stone axe for bludgeoning, the heavy mace whose knob was studded with jagged obsidian, the three-pointed spear of bones barbed at the ends, so they inflicted a tearing wound, or the sword fashioned simply of the toothed snout of the sawfish. But the basic weapons of the Mexica were four. For the opening encounter with an enemy, at a long distance, there was the bow and arrow. We students practiced for a long time with arrows tipped only with soft balls of ollie instead of sharp obsidian. For example, one day the master formed twenty or so of us into a line and said, Suppose the enemy are in that patch of Nepali cactus. He indicated what was, to my fog-bound vision, only a green blur some hundred strides away. I want full pull on the bowstring, and I want your arrows angled upward, exactly midway between where the sun stands and the horizon below him. Ready? Take stable stance. Now take aim at the cactus. Now let fly. There was a swishing noise, and the boys groaned in concert. All the arrows had arced to the ground in a respectably tight grouping, and at the hundred strides distance of the cactus patch. But that was thanks to blood gluttons having specified the pole and the angle. The boys groaned because they had all been equally and dismally off target. The arrows had landed far to the left of the cactus. We looked to the master, waiting for him to tell us how we could have aimed so wrong. He gestured at the square and rectangular battle ensigns, whose staffs were stuck here and there in the ground about us. What are these cloth flags for? he asked. We looked at each other. Then Pactly, son of the Lord Red Heron, replied, they are guidance to be carried by our separate unit leaders in the field. If we get scattered during a battle, the guidance show us where to regroup. Correct, Paxton, said Blood Glutton. Now, that other flag, that lawn feather pennant, what is it for? There was another exchange of glances, and Chimali ventured timidly. We carry it to show pride that we are Mexica. That is the wrong answer, said the master, but a manly one, so I will not whip you. But observe that pen in my boys, how it floats upon the wind. We all looked. There was not enough of a breeze that day to hold the banner straight out from its staff. It hung at an angle to the ground, and... It is blowing to our left, another boy shouted excitedly. We did not aim wrong. The wind carried our arrows away from the target. If you miss your target, the master said dryly, you have aimed wrong. Blaming it on the wind god does not excuse it. To aim correctly, you must consider the force and direction in which Ehekadl is blowing his wind trumpet. That is the purpose of the feather pennon. Which way it hangs shows you which way the wind will carry your arrows. How high it hangs shows you how strongly the wind will carry them. Now, all of you march down there and retrieve your arrows. When you get there, turn about, form a line, and aim at me. The first boy who hits me will be excused for ten days from even his deserved whippings. We did not march. We ran for the arrows, and quite gleefully sent them back at the quackick. But not one of us hit him. For fighting at a nearer range than arrow shot, there was the javelin, a narrow pointed blade of obsidian on a short shaft. Unfeathered, it depended for accuracy and piercing power upon its being thrown with utmost strength. So you do not hurl the javelin unaided, said Blood Glutton. 
but with this atlatl throwing stick. It will seem a clumsy method at first, but after much practice, you will feel the atlatl to be what it is, a lengthening of your arm and a doubling of your strength. At a distance of as many as 30 lawn strides, you can drive the javelin clear through a tree as thick as a man. So imagine, my boys, what it will do when you fling it at a man. There was also the lawn spear, with a broader and heavier obsidian head, for jabbing, thrusting, piercing before an enemy got really close to you. But for the inevitable hand-to-hand -hand fighting, there was the sword, called the Makwa Huidl. It sounds innocent enough, the hunting wood, but it was the most terrible and lethal weapon in our armory. The Makwa Huidl was a flat stave of the very hardest wood, a man's arm long and a man's hand wide, and all along both edges of its length were inset sharp flakes of obsidian. The sword's handle was long enough for wielding the weapon with one hand or with both, and it was carefully carved to fit the grip of that weapon's owner. The obsidian chips were not merely wedged into the wood. So much depended on that sword that even sorcery was added to it. The flakes were cemented solidly with a charmed glue made of liquid ollie the precious perfumed Gopali resin, and fresh blood donated by the priests of the war god, Huitzilopochtli. Obsidian makes a wicked-looking arrowhead or spear or sword edge, as shiny as quartz crystal, but as black as the afterworld Mictlan. Properly flaked, the stone is so keen that it can cut as subtly as a grass blade sometimes does, or cleave as deep as any bludgeon axe. The stone's one weakness is its brittleness. It can shatter against the foe's shield, or against his opposing sword. But, in the hands of a trained fighter, the obsidian-edged Makwahidal can slash a man's flesh and bone as cleanly as if he were a clump of weeds, and in all-out war, as Blood Glutton never ceased reminding us, the enemy are but weeds to be removed. Just as our practice arrows, javelins, and spears were tipped with aliga, so were our mak makwahime made harmless. The stave was of light, soft wood, so the sword would break before it dealt a too punishing blow. And instead of obsidian chips, the edges were outlined only with tufts of feather down. Before any two students fought a sword duel, the master would wet those tufts with red paint, so that every blow received would register as vividly as a real wound, and the mark would last almost as long. In a very short time, I was cross-hatched with wound marks, face and body, and I was quite embarrassed to be seen in public. Then it was that I requested a private audience with our Quackic. He was a tough old man, hard as obsidian, and probably uneducated in anything besides war, but he was no stupid clod. I stooped to make the gesture of kissing the earth, and, still kneeling, said, Master Bloodglutton, you already know that my eyesight is poor. I fear you are wasting time and patience in trying to teach me to soldier. If these marks on my body were real wounds, I should have been dead long since. So, he said coolly. Then he squatted to my level. Fogbound, I will tell you of a man I once met down in Guatemala, the country of the tangled wood. Those people, as perhaps you know, are all timorous of death. 
This particular man scampered from every least suspicion of danger. He avoided the most natural risks of existence. He burrowed away in snug security. He surrounded himself with physicians and priests and sorcerers. He ate only the most nutritious foods, and he seized eagerly on every life-preserving potion he heard of. No man ever took better care of his life. He lived only to go on living. I waited for more, but he said no more. So I asked, What became of him, Master Quackick? He died. That is all? What else ever becomes of any man? I no longer remember even his name. No one remembers anything at all about him, except that he lived and then he died. After another silence, I said, Master, I know that if I am slain in war, my dying will nourish the gods, and they will amply reward me in the afterworld, and perhaps my name will not be forgotten. But might I not be of some service in this world for a while before I achieve my dying? Strike just one telling blow in battle, my boy. Then, even if you are slain the next moment, you will have done something with your life. More than all those men who merely trudge to exist until the gods tire of watching their futility and sweep them off to oblivion. Blood Glutton stood up. Here, Fogbound, this is my own Makwahiro. It long served me well. Just feel the heft of it. I will admit that I experienced a thrill when for the first time I held a real sword, not a toy weapon of cork wood and feathers. It was most atrociously heavy, but its very weight said, I am power. I see that you lift it and swing it with one hand, observed the master. Not many boys your age could do that. Now, step over here, Fogbound. This is a sturdy Nopali. Give it a killing stroke. The cactus was an old one, of nearly tree size. Its spiny green lobes were like petals, and its barked brown trunk was as thick as my waist. I swung the Makwahedal experimentally, with my right hand only, and the obsidian edge bit into the cactus wood with a hungry chunk. I wiggled the blade loose, took the handle in both hands, swung the sword far back behind me, then struck with all my force. I had expected the blade to cut rather more deeply, but I was truly surprised when it slashed cleanly all the way through the trunk, splashing its sap like colorless blood. The Nepali came crashing down, and the master and I both had to leap nimbly away to avoid the falling mass of sharp spines. Hi yo, Fogbound, Blood Glutton said admiringly. Whatever attributes you lack, you do have the strength of a born warrior. I flushed with pride and pleasure, but I had to say, Yes, master, I can strike and kill. But what of my dim vision? Suppose I were to strike the wrong man, one of our own. No quackic in command of novice warriors would ever put you in a position to do so. In a war of flowers, he might assign you to the swaddlers who carry the ropes to bind enemy prisoners that they may be brought back for sacrifice. Or in a real war, you might be assigned to the rearguard swallowers, whose knives give merciful release to those comrades and foes left lying wounded when the battle has swept on past them. Swallowers and swaddlers, I muttered. 
hardly heroic duties to win me a reward in the afterworld. You spoke of this world, the master sternly reminded me, and of service, not heroism. Even the humblest can serve. I remember when we marched into the insolent city of Tlatelolco to annex it to our Tenochtitlan. That city's warriors battled us in the streets, of course, but its women, children, and old daughters stood upon the house steps and threw down at us large rocks, nests full of angry wasps, even handfuls of their own excrement. Right here, my lord scribes, I had better make clear that, among the different kinds of wars we Mexica fought, the battle for Tlatelolco had been an exceptional case. Our revered speaker, Ashiacatl, simply found it necessary to subject, subjugate that haughty city, to deprive it of independent rule, and forcibly to make its people render allegiance to our one great island capital of Tenochtitlan. But, as a general rule, our wars against other peoples were not for conquest, at least not in the sense that your armies have conquered all of this new Spain and made it an abject colony of your mother Spain. No, we might defeat and humble another nation, but we would not obliterate it from the earth. We fought to prove our own might and to exact tribute from the less mighty. When a nation surrendered and acknowledged fealty to us Mexica, it was given a tally of its native resources and products, gold, spices, oli, whatever, that henceforth it would annually deliver in specified quantities to our revered speaker. And it would be held subject to conscription of its fighting men, when and if they should be needed to march alongside us Mexica. But that nation would retain its name and sovereignty, its own ruler, its accustomed way of life, and its preferred form of religion. We would not impose on it any of our laws, customs, or gods. Our war god, Huitzilopochtli, for example, was our god. Under his care, the Mexico were a people set apart from others and above them, and we would not share that god or let him be shared. Quite the contrary. In many defeated nations, we discovered new gods or novel manifestations of our known gods. And, if they appealed to us, our armies brought home copies of their statues for us to set in our own temples. I must tell you, too, that there existed nations from which we never were able to rain tribute or fealty. For instance, contiguous to us in the east, there was Quateshkalan, the land of the equal crags, usually called by us simply Teshkala, the crags. For some reason, you Spaniards choose to call that land Tleshkala, which is laughable, since that word means merely tortilla. Teshkala was completely reigned by countries all allied to us Mexica. Hence it was forced to exist like a landlocked island. But Teshkala adamantly refused ever to submit in the least degree, which meant that it was cut off from importing many necessities of life. If the Teshkalteca had not, however grudgingly, traded with us the sacred Copali resin, in which the forest land was rich, they would not even have had salt to flavor their food. As it was, our U.A. Tlatuani severely restricted the amount of trading between us and the Texcalteca, always in expectation of bringing them to submission. So the stubborn Texcalteca perpetually suffered humiliating deprivations. They had to eke out their meager crop of cotton, for example, meaning that even their nobles had to wear mantles woven of only a trace of cotton mixed with coarse hemp or mogwai fiber, garments which, in Tenochtitlan, 
would have been worn only by slaves or children. You can well understand that Texcala harbored an abiding hatred for us Mexica, and, as you well know, it eventually had dire consequences for us, for the Texcalteca, and for all of what is now New Spain. Meanwhile, said Master Blood Glutton to me on that day we conversed, right now our armies are disastrously embroiled with another recalcitrant nation to the west. The revered speaker's attempted invasion of Michihuacan, the land of the fishermen, has been repulsed most ignominiously. Ashayacatl expected an easy victory, since those Purimpeca have always been armed with copper blades, but they have hurled our armies backward in defeat. But how, master? I asked. An unwarlike race, wielding soft copper weapons? How could they stand against us invincible Mexica? The old soldier shrugged. Unwarlike the poor Ampeca may be, but they fight fiercely enough to defend their Michihuacan homeland of lakes and rivers and well-watered farmlands. Also, it is said they have discovered some magic metal that they mix into their copper while it is still molten. When the mixture is forged into blades, it becomes a metal so hard that our obsidian crumples like bark paper against it. Fishermen and farmers, I murmured, defeating the professional soldiers of Ashayacatl. Oh, we will try again. You may wager on it, said Blood Glutton. This time, Ashayacatl wanted only access to those waters rich in food fish and those fruitful valleys. But now he will want the secret of that magic metal. He will challenge the Purimpeka again, and when he does, his armies will require every man who can march. The master paused, then added pointedly, Even stiff-jointed old Quakikton, like me, even those who can serve only as swallowers and swaddlers, even the crippled and the fog-bound, it behooves us to be trained and hardened and ready, my boy. As it happened, Ashiacatl died before he could mount another invasion into Michihuacan, which is part of what you now call New Galicia. Under subsequent revered speakers, we Mexica and the Purempeca managed to live in a sort of wary mutual respect. And I hardly need remind you, Reverend Friars, that your own most butcher-like commander, Beltran de Guzman, is to this day still trying to crush the die-hard bands of Purimpeca around Lake Chapelin and in other remote corners of New Galicia that yet refuse to surrender to your King Carlos and your Lord God. I have been speaking of our punitive wars, such as they were. I am sure that even your bloodthirsty Guzman can understand that kind of warfare though I am also sure he could never conceive of a war, like most of ours, which left the defeated nation still surviving and independent. But now let me speak of our wars of flowers, because those seem incomprehensible to any of you white men. How, I have heard you ask, could there have been so many unprovoked and unnecessary wars between friendly nations? Wars that neither side even tried to win. I will do my best to explain. Any kind of war was, naturally, pleasing to our gods. Each warrior, dying, spilled his lifeblood, the most precious offering a human could make. In a punitive war, a decisive victory was the objective and so both sides fought to kill or be killed. The enemy were, as my old master put it, weeds to be mowed. Only a comparatively few prisoners were taken and kept for later ceremonial sacrifice. 
But whether a warrior died on the battlefield or on a temple altar, his was accounted a flowery death, honorable to himself and satisfying to the gods. The only problem was, if you look at it from the gods' point of view, that punitive wars were not frequent enough. While they provided much God-nourishing blood and sent many soldiers to be afterworld servants of the gods, such wars were only sporadic. The gods might have to wait and fast and thirst for many years between. That displeased them, and in the year one rabbit they let us know it. That was some twelve years before my birth, but my father remembered it vividly, and often told of it with much sad shaking of his head. In that year, the gods sent to this whole plateau the harshest winter ever known. Besides freezing cold and biting winds, which untimely killed many infants, sickly elders, our domestic animals, and even the animals of the wild, there was a six day snowfall which killed every winter crop in the ground. There were mysterious lights visible in the night skies, wavering vertical bands of cold-colored lights, what my father described as the gods striding ominously about the heavens, nothing of them visible but their mantles woven of white and green and blue heron feathers. And that was only the beginning. The spring brought not just an end to the cold, but a scorching heat. The rainy season ensued, but it brought no rain. The drought killed our crops and animals as dead as the snows had done. Nor was even that the end. The following years were equally merciless in their alternate cold and heat and dearth of rain. In the cold, our lakes froze over. In the heat, they shrank. They became tepid. They became bitter salt, so that the fish died and floated belly up and fouled the air with their stench. Five or six years continued thus, what the older folk of my youth still referred to as the hard times. Yeah, ah, yeah. They must have been terrible times indeed. For our people, our proud and upstanding Makihuatlan, were reduced to selling themselves into slavery. You see, other nations beyond this plateau, in the southern highlands and in the coastal hotlands, they had not been laid waste by the climatic catastrophe. They offered shares of their own still bounteous harvests for barter. But that was no generosity, for they knew that we had little to trade except ourselves. Those other peoples, especially those inferior to us and intudinal to us, were only too pleased to buy the swaggering Mexica for slaves, and to demean us further by paying only cruel and miserly prices. The standard rate was 500 years of maize for a male of working age, or 400 for a female of breeding age. If a family had one sellable child, that boy or girl would be relinquished, so the rest of the household might eat. If a family had only infants, the father would sell himself. But for how long could any household subsist on four or five hundred years of maize? And when those were eaten, who or what remained to be sold? Even if the good times were suddenly to come again, how could a family survive without a working father? Anyway, the good times did not come. That was during the reign of the first Motecuzoma, and, in attempting to alleviate his people's misery, he depleted both the national and his personal treasury, then emptied all the capital storehouses and granaries. 
when the surplus was gone, when everything was gone except the still grinding hard times. When Tekazoma and his snake woman convened their speaking council of elders, and even called in seers and sayers for advice. I cannot vouch for it, but it is said that the conference went thus. One hoary sorcerer, who had spent months in studying the throne bones and consulting sacred books, solemnly reported, My lord speaker, the gods have made us hungry to demonstrate that they are hungry. There has not been a war since our last incursion in the Teshkala, and that was in the year Nine House. Since then, we have made only sparse blood offerings to the gods. A few prisoners kept in reserve, the occasional lawbreaker, now and then an adolescent or a maiden. The gods are quite plainly demanding more nourishment. Another war, mused Motekazoma. Even our hardiest warriors are by now too feeble even to march to an enemy frontier, let alone breach it. True, revered speaker. But there is a way to arrange a mass sacrifice. Slaughter our people before they starve to death? Motekazoma asked sardonically. They are so gaunt and dried up that the whole nation probably would not yield a cupful of blood. True, revered speaker. And in any case, that would be such a mendic mendicant gesture that the gods probably would not accept it. No, Lord Speaker. What is necessary is a war, but a different kind of war. That, or so I have been told, and so I believe, was the origin of the flowery wars. And this is how the first of them was arranged. The mightiest and most centrally situated powers in this valley constituted a triple alliance. We, the Mexica, with our capital on the island of Tenochtitlan, the Aklahua, with their capital at Texcoco, on the lake's eastern shore, and the Tecpaneca, with their capital at Tlacopan, on the western shore. There were three lesser peoples to the southeast, the Texcalteca, of whom I have already spoken, with their capital at Teshkala, the Huishotin, with their capital at Huishotzinko, and the once mighty Tianu, or Mishteka, as we called them, whose domain had shrunken until it consisted of little more than their capital city of Cholala. The first were our enemies, as I have said. The latter two had long ago been made our tribute payers, and, like it or not, our occasional allies. All three of those nations, however, like all three of ours in the Alliance, were being devastated by the hard times. After Motekuzoma's conference with his speaking council, he conferred also with the rulers of Teshkoko and Tlacopan. Those three together drafted and sent a proposal to the three rulers in the city of Teshkala, Chololten, and Huichosinko. In essence, it said something like this. Let us all make war that we may all survive. We are diverse peoples, but we suffer the same hard times. The wise men say that we have only one hope of enduring, to see and placate the gods with blood sacrifices. Therefore, we propose that the armies of our three nations meet in combat with the armies of your three nations, on the neutral plain of Akatsinko, safely far to the southeast of all our lands. The fighting will not be for territory, nor for rule, nor for slaughter, nor for plunder, but simply for the taking of prisoners to be granted the flowery death. 
when all participating forces have captured a sufficiency of prisoners for sacrifice to their several gods. This will be mutually made known amongst the commanders, and the battle will end forthwith. That proposal, which you Spaniards say you find incredible, was agreeable to all concerned, including the warriors whom you have called stupidly suicidal, because they fought for no apparent end, except the extremely likely and sudden end to their own lives. Well, tell me, what professional soldier of your own would refuse any excuse for a battle, in preference to humdrum, peacetime garrison duty? At least our warriors had the stimulus of knowing that if they died in combat or on an alien altar, they earned all people's thanks for pleasing the gods, while they earned the gods' gift of life in a blissful afterworld. And in those hard times, when so many died of inglorious starvation, a man had even more reason for preferring to die by the sword or the sacrificial knife. So that first battle was planned, and it was fought as planned though the plain of Akatsinko was a dreary long march from anywhere. So all six armies had to rest for a day or two before the signal was given to commence hostilities. Other intentions notwithstanding, a goodly number of men were killed, some inadvertently, by chance and accident, some because they or their opponents fought too exuberantly. It is difficult for a warrior, trained to kill, to refrain from killing. But most, as agreed, struck with the flat of the maquahedal, not with the obsidian edge. The men thus stunned were not dispatched by the swallowers, but were quickly bound by the swaddlers. After only two days, the priest chaplains who marched with each army decided that prisoners enough had been taken to satisfy them and their gods. One after another, the commanders unfurled the prearranged banners, the knots of men still grappling on the plain, disengaged. The six armies reassembled and marched wearily home, leading their even wearier captives. That first tentative war of flowers took place in midsummer, normally also mid-rainy season. But in those hard times, just another of the interminable hot dry spells. And one other thing had been prearranged by the six rulers of the six nations, that all of them should sacrifice all their prisoners in their six capital cities on the same day. No one remembers the exact count but I suppose several thousand men died that day in Tenochtitlan, in Texcoco, in Tlacopan, in Texcala, in Chololan, in Huishotzinco. Call it coincidence if you like, Reverend Friars, since the Lord God was of course not involved. But that day, the casks of clouds at last broke their seals, and the rain poured down on all this extensive plateau, and the hard times had come to an end. That very day, also, many people in the six cities enjoyed full bellies for the first time in years, when they dined on the remains of the sacrificed Xochimique. The gods were satisfied to be fed merely with the ripped-out hearts heaped on their altars. They had no use for the remainder of the victims' bodies but the gathered people did. So, as the corpse of each Xochimiqui, still warm, rolled down the steep staircase of each temple pyramid, the meat cutters waiting below dissected it into its edible parts and distributed those among the eager folk crowding each plaza. The skulls were cracked and the brains extracted the arms and legs were cut into manageable segments. 
The genitals and buttocks were sliced off. The livers and kidneys were cut out. Those food portions were not just flung to a slavering mob. They were distributed with admirable practicality, and the populace waited with admirable restraint. For obvious reasons, the brains went to priests and wise men, the muscular arms and legs to warriors, the genitalia to young married couples. The less significant buttocks and tripes were presented to pregnant women, nursing mothers, and families with many children. The leftovers of heads, hands, feet, and torsos, being more bone than meat, were put aside to fertilize the croplands. That feast of fresh meat may or may not have been an additional advantage foreseen by the planners of the flowery war. I do not know. All the various peoples in these lands had long ago eaten every still existing game animal, every domesticated bird and dog raised for food. They had eaten lizards and insects and cactus, but they never had eaten any of their relatives and neighbors who succumbed to the hard times. It might be thought an unconscionable waste of available nutriment, but in every nation the starving people had disposed of their starved fellows by burial or burning, according to their custom. Now, however, thanks to the War of Flowers, they had an abundance of bodies of unrelated enemies, even if those were enemies only by an exaggeration of definition. And so there was no compunction about making a meal of them. In the aftermath of later wars, there was never again such an immediate butchery and gorging, since there was never again such a mazed and ravenish hunger to assuage the priests set up rules and rituals to formalize the eating of captive's flesh. The victorious warriors of later years took only token morsels of their dead enemy's muscular parts and partook of them ceremoniously. The bulk of the meat was apportioned out among the really poor folk, generally meaning the slaves, or was fed to the animals in those cities which, like Tenochtitlan, maintain the public menagerie. Human flesh, like almost any other animal flesh, when properly hung, aged, seasoned, and broiled, makes a tasty dish, and it is suitable for sustenance when there is no other meat. However, just as it can be proven that close kinship marriage among our noble families did not result in superior offspring, but more often the contrary. I think it could be equally demonstrated that humans who feed only on humans must similarly decline. If a family's bloodline is best improved by marriage outside the line, so a man's blood must be best strengthened by the ingestion of other animals. Thus, with the passing of the hard times, the practice of eating the slain Xochimique became for all but the desperate and degenerate poor, only one more religious observance, and a minor one. But that first war of flowers was such a success, coincidence or not, that the same six nations continued to wage others at regular intervals for a safeguard against any future displeasure of the gods and any recurrence of the hard times. I dare say we Mexica had little further need of that stratagem, for Motecuzoma and the revered speaker who succeeded him did not again let years elapse between real wars. There was seldom a time thereafter when we did not have an army in the field, extending our tributary dominion. But the Akolhua and the Tecpaneca, having few ambitions of that sort, had to depend on the wars of flowers to provide flowery deaths for their gods. So, since Tenochtitlan had been the instigator, it continued willingly to participate. 
the Triple Alliance versus the Teshkalteka, the Mishteka, and the Hoysholden. To the warriors, it mattered not. Punitive war or flowery war, a man had as much chance of dying. He had also as much opportunity of being acclaimed a hero, or even awarded one of the orders of knighthood, whether he left a notable number of enemies dead on some disputed field, or brought home a notable number alive from the plain of Akatsinko. For know this, Fogbound, said Master Bloodglutton, on that day of which I have spoken. No warrior, in a real war or a war of flowers, must ever expect to be counted among the fallen or the captured. He must expect to live through the war and to come out of it a hero. Oh, I will not dissemble, my boy. He may very well die, yes, while still thrilling to that expectation. But if he goes into battle not expecting victory for his side and glory for himself, die he surely will. I tried to convey, while trying not to sound pusillanimous, that I was not afraid to die, but neither was I eager to in whatever kind of war. I was evidently destined for no higher office than swallower or swaddler. Such a duty, I pointed out, could as well be assigned to women. Would I not be of more value to the Mexican nation, to humanity as a whole, if I were allowed to exercise my other talents? What other talents? grunted Blood Glutton. That stopped me for a moment, but then I suggested that if, for example, I succeeded in mastering the picture writing, I could accompany the army as a battle historian. I could sit apart on an overlooking hilltop, perhaps, and write a description of each battle's strategy and tactics and progress for the edification of future commanders. The old soldier regarded me with exasperation. First you say you cannot see to fight an opponent face to face. Now you say you will encompass the whole confused action of two entire clashing armies. Fogbound, if you are seeking exemption from the school's weapons practice, save your breath. I could not excuse you if I would. In your case, there is a charge upon me. A charge, I said, nonplussed. A charge from whom, master? He frowned, annoyed, as if caught in a slip of the tongue, and growled. A charge I impose upon myself. It is my sincere belief that every man should experience one war, or at least one battle, in his lifetime. Because, if he survives, he savors all the rest of his life the more richly and dearly. Now, enough of this. I shall expect to see you on the field as usual at tomorrow's dusk. So I went away then, and I went on with the combat drills and lessons in the days and months that followed. I knew not what the future held for me, but I did know one thing. If I was destined for some undesirable duty, there were only two ways to evade it. Either show myself incapable of it, or show myself too good for it. And good scribes were at least not made weeds for the obsidian to mow. That is why, while I uncomplainingly attended both the houses of building strength and learning manners, in private, I worked ever more intensely and feverishly to puzzle out the secrets of the art of a word knowing. I would make the gesture of kissing the earth, Your Excellency, if that were a custom still observed. Instead, I simply straighten my old bones upright so that I stand, like your friars, to salute your entrance. 
It is an honor to have Your Excellency's presence grace our little group once again, and to hear you say that you have examined the collected pages of my story thus far. But Your Excellency asks searching questions relative to certain events therein, and I must confess that your questions make me lower my eyelids in embarrassment, even in some shame. Yes, Your Excellency. My sister and I continued to enjoy each other at every opportunity during those growing up years of which I have recently spoken. And yes, Your Excellency, we knew that we sinned. Probably Sitsitlini knew it from the start, but I was younger, so it was only gradually that I became aware that what we were doing was wrong. Over the years, I have come to realize that our females always knew more about the mysteries of sex, and knew it earlier than any males. I suspect the same is true of the females of all races, including your own, for they seem inclined, from their younger years, to whisper among themselves, and to trade what secrets they learn about their own bodies and the bodies of men, and to consort with old widows and crones who, perhaps because their own juices have long gone dry, are gleefully or maliciously eager to instruct young maidens in womanly wiles and snares and deceptions. I regret that I am not, even yet, sufficiently knowledgeable of my new Christian religion to know all its rules and strictures on the subject, though I gather that it frowns on every manifestation of sexuality, except an occasional copulation between Christian husband and wife for the purpose of producing a Christian child. But even we heathens observed a few, a few laws and a great many traditions regarding accepted sexual behavior. A maiden was to remain a virgin until she married, and she was encouraged not to marry young. For our religion recognized that our living room and resources would be depleted by more than a moderate harvest of children in each generation. Or a maiden might choose not to marry, but to join the Aaname, whose service to our warriors was a legitimate female occupation, if not exactly an exalted one. Or, if she was disqualified for marriage by ugliness or some other deficiency, she might become a ma matito for pay, and go astraddle the road. There were some girls who maintained their maidenhood so that they might win the honor of sacrifice in some ceremony which required a virgin, and others so that they might serve all their lives, like your nuns, as attendants to the temple priests, though there was speculation about the nature of that attendance and the duration of that virginity. Chastity before marriage was not so demanded of our men, for they had always available the willing Matime and the slave woman, willing or unwilling. And anyway, a man's virginity can hardly be proved or disproved. Neither can a woman's, I might confide, as Sitsi confided to me. If she has time to prepare before her wedding night, There are old women who keep pigeons that they feed with the dark red seeds of some flower known to them, and they sell the eggs of those birds to would-be virgins. A pigeon's egg is small enough to be easily secreted deep inside a woman, and its shell is so fragile that an excited bridegroom will break it without feeling it, and the yolk of that especially bred egg is the exact color of blood. Also, the crones sell to women an astringent ointment made from the berry which you call the buckthorn, which will pucker the most slack and gaping orifice to adolescent tightness. 
As you command, Your Excellency. I shall try to refrain from giving so many specific particulars. Rape was a crime not often heard of among our people. For, th for three reasons. First, it was almost impossible to commit without being caught, since most of our communities were so small that everyone knew everyone else, and strangers were exceedingly noticeable. Also, it was a rather unnecessary crime, there being plenty of matime and slave women to satisfy a man's really urgent needs. Also, rape was punished with death. So was adultery, and so was kulan yodel, the sex between man and man. And so was platakuya, the sex act between woman and woman. But those crimes, while probably not rare, were rarely discovered unless the partners were caught in the act. Such sins are, like virginity, otherwise elusive of proof. I should make it clear that I speak here only of those practices banned or shunned in Manos Mexica. Except for the sexual liberties and ostens ostentations permitted during some of our fertility ceremonies, we Mexica were rather austere in comparison to many other peoples. I remember, when I first traveled among the Maya, far to the south of here, I was shocked by the aspect of some of their temples, which had their roof drain pipes formed in the shape of a man's tapuli. All during the rainy season, they urinated unceasingly. The Huashteca, who live to the northeast, on the shore of the Eastern Sea, are exceptionally gross in matters of sex. I have seen temple friezes there carved with representations of the many positions a man and woman can assume. And any Huashtekekul Huashtekatl man, with a tipuli larger than average, would go walking about, even in public, even when visiting more civilized places, wearing no loincloth at all. That boastful strutting gave the Huashteca men a reputation for rampant virility, which may or may not have been deserved. However, on those occasions when captured Huashteca warriors have been put up for sale at the slave market, I have seen our own Mexica noblewomen, veiled and staying on the fringe of the crowd, but making signals for their servant to bid for this or that wash the cattle on the selling block. The poor in Pekka of Michihuacan to the west of here are most lax or lenient in matters of sex. For example, the sex act between a man and a man is not only not punished, it is condoned and accepted. It has even got into their picture writing. Perhaps you know that the symbol for a woman's tapili is the drawing of a snail shell. Well, to write of the act between two males, the poor Impeka unashamedly would draw the picture of a nude man with a snail shell covering his real organs. As for the act between my sister and myself, your word is incest? Yes, Your Excellency. I believe that was forbidden in every nation known. And yes, we risked death if we had been caught. The laws prescribed particularly grisly forms of execution for copulation between brother and sister, father and daughter, mother and son, uncle and niece, and so on but such couplings were prohibited only to us Makehualten, who constituted most of the population. As I earlier remarked, 
There were noble families which strove to preserve what they called the purity of their bloodlines, by confining their marriages only to near relatives. Though there was never any evidence that it improved any succeeding generations. And, of course, not the law, nor tradition, nor people in general, gave much notice to what went on among the slave class. Rape, incest, adultery, what have you. But you ask how my sister and I evaded discovery during our long indulgence in our sin. Well, having been so harshly chastised by our mother for much lesser mischiefs, we had both learned to be discreet in the extreme. A time came when I was away from Shaltican for months on end, and I ached for Tsitsitlini, and she ached for me. But at every homecoming, I would give her only a cool, brotherly kiss on the cheek, and we would sit apart, concealing our inner tumult, while I recounted to our parents and other news-hungry relatives and friends all my doings in the world beyond our island. It might be a day or several days before Tsitsi and I could find or make an opportunity to be together in private and in secret and in no danger. Ah, but then, the hasty disrobing, the frantic caresses, the first release, as if we two lay on the slope of our own small, secret, and awakening volcano. Then the more leisurely fondlings, the softer and more exquisite explosions. But my absences from the island came later. Meanwhile, my sister and I were never once surprised in the act. Of course, we would have incurred calamity if, like Christians, we had conceived a child at every coupling, or at any of them. That possibility might have entered, might never have entered my own head. What boy could imagine being a father? But Tsitsi was a female, and wiser about such things, and she had taken precautions against the contingency. Those old women of whom I have spoken, they sold secretly to unmarried maidens, as our apothecaries sold openly to married couples who did not want to make a child every time they went to bed. A powder ground from Tlatlahuehuetl, which is what, which is that tuber like a sweet potato, only a hundred times bigger what you call in Spanish the barbasco. Any woman who daily takes a dose of the powdered barbasco runs no risk of conceiving an unwanted... Forgive me, Your Excellency. I had no idea I was saying anything sacrilegious. Do please be seated again. I must report that, for a long time, I was personally running a risk, even when I was safely distant from Tsitsi. During our twilight military classes at the House of Building Strength, squads of six or eight boys together were regularly sent off to remote fields or stands of trees, where we did a pretense of standing guard against attack on the school. It was a boring duty which we usually enlivened by playing patoli with jumping beans. But then, some one of the boys, I forget who, discovered the solitary act. He was not shy or selfish about his discovery, <laughs> and immediately demonstrated the art to the rest of us. From then on, the boys no longer carried beans when they went on guard, they had their game's equipment attached. For that is all it amounted to, a game. We held contests and made wagers on the amount of omaketal we could ejaculate. 
the number of times we could do it in succession, and the time needed in between for resurgence. It was like our even younger days, when we had competed to see who could spit or urinate farthest or most copiously. But in this new competition, I was at hazard. You see, I often came to the games not long out of the embrace of Tsitsi, and, as you can imagine, my reservoir of omakettle was pretty well drained, not to mention my capacity for arousal. Hence, my ejaculations were but few and feeble dribbles compared with the other boys, and often I could not get my tipuli erect at all. For a time, my comrades hooted and made fun of me, but then they began to regard me with worried and even pitying looks. Some of the more compassionate boys suggested remedies to me, eating raw meat, sweating lawn in the steam house, things like that. My two best friends, Chamali and Thotli, had discovered that they achieved vastly more thrilling sensations when each manipulated the other's stipuli rather than his own. So they suggested. Filth? Obscenity? It lacerates your ears to hear me? I am sorry if I distress your excellency, and you, my lord scribes. But I do not relate these events out of idle pr prurience. They all have a bearing on less trivial events which came later and which came as a result of all this. If you will hear me out. Eventually, some of the older boys got the idea of putting their tapultin where they belonged. A few of our comrades, including Pactley, the governor's son, went scouting in the village nearest our school. There they found and drafted into service a slave woman of twenty-some years, maybe even thirty. Rather fittingly, her name was Teteo Temekalis, meaning gift of the gods. At any rate, she was a gift to the guard posts, which thereafter she visited almost daily. Pactley had the authority to command her to that attendance, but I do not believe she had to be commanded for she proved a willing, even vigorous participant in the sexual games. I, uh, I suppose the poor slut had reason. She had a comical bulge on her nose, and she was dumpily built, with great doughy thighs, and I imagine she had not much hope of marriage, even to a man of her own Tlacotli class. So she took to her new avocation of road straddler with lewd abandon. As I have said, there might be six or eight boys camping a field at the guard posts on any given evening. When Gift of the Gods had serviced each of that number, the first would be ready for another turn, and the round would begin again. I am sure the lascivious gift of the gods could have gone on all night. But after a while of that activity, she would get full of oma kettle, slimy and slippery, and begin to give off the odor of an unhealthy fish. So the boys would stop of their own accord and send her home. But she would be there again the next afternoon, stripped naked, splayed wide open, and panting to commence. I had taken no part in those doings, had done no more than watch, until one evening, when Pactly finished using the gift of the gods, he whispered something to her, and she came to where I sat. You are Mole, she said, leering, and Paxin tells me you have a difficulty. 
She made movements of temptation, her loose-lipped tepili directly in front of my burning face. Perhaps your spear would welcome being held in me, and not in your fist for a change. I mumbled that I was not in any need of her at the moment, but I could not protest too much, with six or seven of my comrades standing about and grinning at my discomfiture. I yo, she exclaimed, when with her hands she lifted my mantle and undid my loincloth. Yours is a choice one, Yan Mo. She bounced it in her palm. Even unawakened, it is grander than the Tepuli of any of the older boys, even that of the noble Pekton. My surrounding fellows laughed and nudged each other. I did not look up at the Lord Red Heron's son, but I knew that gift of the gods had just earned for me an enemy. Surely, she said, a gracious Makwahali will not deny pleasure to a humble Flakotli. Let me arm my warrior with a weapon. She took my member between her big, flabby breasts, squeezed them together with one arm, and began to massage me with them. Nothing happened. Then she did other, other things to me, attentions with which she had not favored even Pactly. He turned, thunder-faced, and stalked away from us. Still nothing happened. Although she even... Yes, yes. I hasten to conclude this episode. Gift of the Gods finally gave up in annoyance. She threw my tepuli back against my belly and said petulantly, The conceited cub warrior saves his virginity, no doubt for a woman of his own class. She spat on the ground, abruptly left me, seized another boy, wrestled him down, and began to buck like a wasp-stunned deer. Well, His Excellency did ask me to speak of sex and sin, did he not, Reverend Friars? But it seems he cannot ever listen for long without turning as purple as his cassock and betaking himself elsewhere. I should at least like him to know what I was leading up to, but of course, I was forgetting. His Excellency can read of it when he is calmer. May I proceed then, my lords? Chimali came and sat beside me and said, I was not one of those who laughed at you, Mo. She does not excite me either. It is not so much that she is ugly and slovenly, I said and I told Chamali what my father had recently told me, of that disease, Nanua, which can come from unclean sexual practices. The disease which afflicts so many of your Spanish soldiers, and which they fatalistically call the fruit of the earth. Women who make a decent career of their sex are not to be feared, I told Chamali. Our warriors, Ayaname, for instance, keep themselves clean, and they are regularly inspected by the army physicians. But the Matime who will spread themselves for just anybody, and for any number, they are best avoided. The disease comes from unclean parts, and this creature here, who knows what squalid slave men she services before she comes to us. If you ever get infected with the Nenua, there is no cure. It can rot your tepuli so it falls off, and it can rot your brain until you are a stumbling, stammering idiot. That is the truth, Mool? asked Jamali, quite ashen in the face. He looked at the sweating, heaving boy and woman on the ground. I was going to have her too, 
just so I would not be jeered at. But I had rather be unmanly than be an idiot. He went at once and informed Tlotli. Then they must have spread the word, for the waiting line diminished after that evening. And in the steam house, I often saw my comrades examining themselves for symptoms of rot. The woman came to be called by a variant of her name, Teteo Tlayo, Awful of the Gods. But some of the schoolboys continued recklessly rutting on her, and one of those was Pactly. My contempt for him must have been as obvious as his dislike of me, for he came to me one day and said menacingly, So the mole is too careful of his health to soil himself with a matito. I know that is only your excuse for your pitiable impotence, but it implies criticism of my behavior, and I warn you not to slander your future brother. I gaped at him. Yes, before I rot, as you predict, I intend to marry your sister. Even if I become a diseased and shambling idiot, she cannot refuse a nobleman. But I would prefer that she come to me willingly, so I tell you, brother-to-be, never let Tsitsitlini know of my sport with Awful of the Gods, or I will kill you. He strode away without waiting for me to reply, which, in any case, I could not have done at that moment. I was dumb with dread. It was not that I feared Pactly personally, since I was a shade the taller of us, and probably the stronger. But if he had been a weakling dwarf, he was still the son of Articutely, and now he bore me a grudge. The fact was that I had lived in trepidation ever since the boys began their games of solitary sex, and then their couplings with Awful of the Gods. My poor performance and the derision I endured, those embarrassments did not wound my boyish vanity so much as they put fear in my vitals. I truly had to be thought impotent and unmanly. Pactly was as underwitted as he was overbearing, but if he ever began to suspect the real reason for my seemingly feeble sexuality, that I was lavishing it all elsewhere. He was not too stupid to wonder where. And on our small island, it would not take him long to ascertain that I could be trysting with no female except... Tsitsitlini had first caught Pactly's interest when she was only a butt of a girl, when she visited the palace to attend the execution of his own adulterous sister princess. More recently, at the springtime feast of the Great Awakening, Tsitsi had led the dancers in the Pyramid Plaza, and Pactly had seen her dance, and he had been fully smitten. Since then, he had repeatedly managed to encounter her in public, and had spoken to her, a breach of manners for any man, even a Pili. He had also recently invented excuses to visit our house two or three times, to discuss quarry affairs with Tepetzalan, and there he had to be let enter. But Tsitsi's cool reception of him and her unconcealed distaste for him would have sent any other young man slinking away for good. And now the vile Pactly told me he was going to marry Tsitsi. I went home from school that night, and, as we sat around our supper cloth, after our father had given thanks to the gods for the food before us, I bluntly spoke up. Pactly told me today that he intends to take Tsitsitlini to wife. 
not perhaps, or if she accepts him, or if the family gives consent, but that he intends it and will do it. My sister stiffened and stared at me. She drew her hand lightly across her face, as our women always do at something unexpected. Our father looked uncomfortable. Our mother went on placidly eating, and just as placidly said, He has spoken of it, Beachley, yes. Paxton will soon be out of the primary school, but he still must spend some years at the Kalmakak school before he can take a wife. He cannot take Tzitzi, I said. Pactly is a stupid, greedy, unwholesome creature. Our mother leaned across the cloth and slapped my face hard. That is for speaking disrespectfully of our future governor. Who are you? What is your high station that you presume to defame a noble? Biting back uglier words, I said, I am not the only one on this island who knows Pactley to be a depraved and contemptible. She hit me again. To Petzilon, she said to her father, One more word out of this unruly young man, and you must attend to his correction. To me, she said, when the Peely son of the Lord Red Heron marries Sitsitlini, all the rest of us become Papilton as well. What are your great prospects, with no trade, with only your useless pretense of studying word pictures, that you could bring such eminence to your family? Our father cleared his throat and said, I care not so much for the sin to our names, but I care less for discourtesy and the infamy. To refuse a noble man any request, especially to decline the honor Pactly confers by asking our daughter's hand, would be an insult to him, a disgracing of ourselves that we could never live down. If we were let to live at all, we would have to leave Sheltakan. No, not the rest of you. Sitsi spoke for the first time, and firmly. I will leave. If that degenerate beast packedly. Do not raise your hand to me, mother. I am a woman grown, and I will strike you back. You are my daughter, and this is my house, shouted our mother. Children, what has come over you? pleaded our father. I say only this, Tzitzi went on. If Pactly demands me, and you exceed, not you or he will ever see me again. I will leave the island forever. If I cannot borrow or steal an acoli, I will swim. If I cannot reach the mainland, I will drown. Not Pactly or any other man will ever touch me, except a man I can give myself to. On all of Sheltakan, our mother sputtered, no other daughter so ungrateful, so disobedient and defiant, so... This time she was silenced by our father, who said, and said solemnly, Sitsitlini, if your unfilial words had been heard outside these walls, not even I could pardon you or avert your due punishment. You would be stripped and beaten and your head shaved. Our neighbors would do it if I did not, as an example to their own children. I am sorry, father, she said in a level voice. You must choose. An undutiful daughter, or none? I thank the gods I need not choose tonight. As your mother remarked, it will be a few years yet before the young Lord Joy can marry. 
so let us speak of it no more now, in anger or otherwise. Many things may happen between now and then. Our father was right. Many things might happen. I did not know if Sitsi had meant everything she said, and I had no chance to ask her that night or the next day. We dared no more than to exchange a worried and yearning glance from time to time. But, whether or not she held to her resolve, the prospect was desolating. If she fled from Pactley, I should lose her. If she succumbed and married him, I should lose her. If she went to his bed, she knew the arts of convincing him that she was virgin. But if... Before then, my own behavior made Pactly suspect that another man had known her first, and me of all men. His rage would be monumental, his revenge inconceivable. Whatever the hideous manner he chose for slaying us, Sitsi and I would have lost each other. I, uh, many things did happen. And one of them was this. When I went to the house of building strength at the next day's dusk, I found my name and Pactley's on Blood Glutton's roster, as if it had been ordained by some ironic god. And when our squad got to the appointed patch of trees, Offal of the Gods was already there, already naked, sprawled and ready. To the astonishment of Pactley and our other companions, I immediately ripped off my loincloth and flung myself upon her. I did it as clumsily as I could, a performance calculated to make the other boys believe it was my first, and a performance that probably gave the slut as little pleasure as it gave me. When I judged it had gone on long enough, I prepared to disengage, but then the revulsion got the better of me, and I spewed vomit all over her face and naked body. The boys roared and rolled on the ground with laughter. Even the wretch, awful of the gods, was capable of recognizing the insult. She gathered up her garments, and she clutched them over her nakedness, and she ran away, and she never came back. Not long after that incident, four other things of note occurred in rather rapid succession. At least, that is how I remember them happening. It happened that our Yue Tlatawani Ashiyakadu died, very young, from the effects of wounds he had received in the battles against the Purempeka. And his brother, Tishak, other face, assumes the throne of Tenochtitlan. It happened that I, along with Chimali and Tlatli, completed what schooling was afforded on Shaltakan. I was now regarded as educated. It happened that our island's governor sent a messenger to our house one evening to summon me immediately to his palace. And it happened that at last, I was parted from Tzitzitlini, my sister and my love. But I had best recount these occurrences in more detail, and in the order of their happening. The change of rulers did not much affect the lives of us in the provinces. Indeed, even in Tenochtitlan, little was later remembered of Tishak's reign, except that, like his two predecessors, he continued work on the still-rising Great Pyramid in the heart of the One World. And Tishak added an ar architectural touch of his own to that plaza. He had stonemasons hew and carve the battle stone, a massive flat cylinder of volcanic rock which lay like a stack of immense tortillas between the unfinished pyramid and the sunstone's pedestal site. The battle stone was nearly as high as a man, 
and about four strides across its diameter. Around the rim were low-relief carvings of Mexica warriors, Tishak prominent, prominent among them, engaged in combat and in subduing captives. The flat round top of the stone was the platform for a kind of public dueling, in which, a long time later, and in an unusual way, I would have occasion to participate. Of rather more immediate concern to me at that time was the end of my formal schooling. Not being of the nobility, I was, of course, not entitled to go on to a Kalmakak of higher learning. And my record as Malinqui the Kink in one of our schools, and as Poyautla the Fogbound in the other, had hardly been of a nature to make any of the higher schools on the mainland invite me to attend at no cost. What particularly embittered me was that, while I hungered in vain for the chance to learn more than the trivial knowledge our Talpakultan could teach, my friends Chimali and Tlatli, who cared not a little finger for any further formal learning, did get an invitation from separate Kalmakactan, and both of those in Tenochtitlan, my own dream destination. During their years in Shaltakan's house of building strength, they had distinguished themselves as Tlactli players and as cub warriors. Though an elegant nobleman might have smiled at the graces the two boys had absorbed from the house of learning manners, they had nevertheless shown there too, by designating original costumes and settings for the ceremonies performed on festival days. It is too bad you cannot come with us, Mole, said Tlatli, sounding sincere enough, but no whit less happy at his own good fortune. You could attend all the dull schoolroom classes and leave us free for our studio work. Under the terms of their acceptance, both boys would, besides learning from the Kalmakak priests, also be apprenticed out to Tenochtitlan artists. Tlatli to a master sculptor, Chimali to a master painter. I was sure that neither of them would pay much heed to the lessons in history, reading, writing, counting, and such, the very things I ached for most. Anyway, before they departed, Chimali said, Here is a goodbye gift for you, Mo. All my paints and reeds and brushes. I will have better ones in the city, and you may find them useful in your writing practice. Yes, I was still pursuing my untutored study in the arts of reading and writing, though my ever becoming a word knower now seemed hopelessly remote, and my moving to Tenochtitlan a dream that would forever come untrue. My father had likewise despaired of my ever becoming a dedicated quarrier, and I was now too old to serve only to sit at the empty pit and chew away animals. So, for some while past, I had been earning my keep and contributing to our family support by working as a common farm boy. Of course, Shaltokan has no such thing as farmland. There is not enough arable topsoil for stable crops like the maize, which requires deep earth for its nourishment. So Shaltakan, like all island communities, grows the bulk of its vegetable foods on the wide and ever-spreading chinampa, which you call floating gardens. Each chinamatito is a raft of woven tree limbs and branches, moored at the lake edge then spread with load upon load of the richest soil, freighted out from the mainland. As the crops extend their roots season by season, new roots twining down old ones, they eventually clutch the lake bottom and hold the raft firmly in place. Other gardens are built and moored alongside. 
every inhabited island in all the lakes, Tenochtitlan included, wears a wide ring of fringe of these chinampa. On some of the more fertile islands, it is difficult to discern where the God-made land leaves off and the man-made fields begin. It takes no more than mole eyesight or mole intellect to tend such gardens. So I tended those belonging to our family and neighbors in our quarter. The work was undemanding. I had plenty of free time. I applied myself, and Chimali's gift of paints, to the drawing of word pictures, training myself to make the most complex symbols ever simpler, more stylized, smaller in size. Unlikely as it then seemed, I still nursed the secret hope that my self-education might somehow yet improve my lot in life. I smile pityingly now to recall my young self sitting on a dirt raft among the sprouting maize and beans and chilies, among the reeking fertilizer of animal entrails and fish heads, while I scribbled away at my writing practice and dreamed my lofty dreams. For example, I toyed with the ambition of becoming one of the Pokteca traveling merchants, and thus journeying into the Maya lands, where some wonder-working doctor would restore my eyesight well, I should become rich from my shrewd trading along the way. Oh, I derived many a plan to turn a trifling amount of trade goods into a towering fortune. Ingenious plans that I was sure no previous trader had ever thought of. The only obstacle to my assured success, as Tsetse tactfully pointed out when I confided some of my ideas, was that I lacked even the trifling amount of capital I reckoned I would need to begin with. And then, one afternoon, when the workday was done, one of the Lord Red Heron's messengers appeared at our house door. He wore a mantle of neutral color, signifying neither good news nor bad, and he said politely to my father, Mitch Pansinko, Shimo Panolto, said my father, gesturing for him to enter. The young man, about my own age, took only a single step inside and said, The Takutli Tlaquetzolzin, my master and yours, requires the presence of your son, Chikome Shochito Tilectic Michli, at the palace. My father and sister looked surprised and bewildered. I supposed I did, too. My mother did not. She wailed. Yeah, oh yeah. I knew the boy would one day offend the nobles or the gods or... She broke off to demand of the messenger. What mischief has Meechley done? There is no need for the Lord Red Heron to trouble himself with whipping or whatever is decreed. We will gladly attend to the punishment. I do not know that anyone has done anything, said the messenger, eyeing her warily. I merely obey my order, to bring him without delay. And without delay I accompanied him, preferring whatever waited at the palace to whatever my mother's imagination might conceive. I was curious, yes, but I could not think of any reason to quake. If that summons had come at an earlier time, I would have worried that the malicious Pactly had contrived some charge against me. But the young Lord Joy had himself gone off, two or three years before, to a Tenochtitlan Kalmakek, which accepted only the Skians of ruling families, themselves rulers to be. Pactly had since come back to Sheltaken only on brief school holidays. During those visits, he had paid calls at our house, but always during the workday when I was not at home. So I had not even seen him since the days of our having briefly shared Offal of the Gods. 
The messenger stayed a respectful few paces behind me as I entered the palace throne room and bent to make the gesture of kissing the earth. Beside Lord Red Heron sat a man I had never seen on the island before. Though the stranger sat on a lower chair, as was proper, he considerably diminished our governor's usual air of importance. Even my mole vision could make out that he wore a brilliant feather mantle and ornaments of a richness that no nobleman of Chaltecan could flaunt. Red Heron said to the visitor, The request was, Make a man of him. Well, our houses of building strength and learning manners have done their utmost. Here he is. I am bidden to make a test, said the stranger. He produced a small roll of bark paper and held it out to me. Mich Pansinko, I said to the nobles before I unrolled the thing. It bore nothing I could recognize as a test, only a single line of word pictures, and I had seen them before. You can read it? asked the stranger. I forgot to mention that said Red Heron, as if he had taught me himself. Meechly can read some simple things with a fair measure of comprehension. I said, I can read this, my lords. It says, never mind, the stranger interrupted. Just tell me, what does the duck-billed face signify? A hecatl, the wind, my lord. Anything else? Well, my lord, with the other figure, the closed eyelids, it says night wind. But, yes, speak up, young man. If my lord will excuse my impertinence, that one figure does not show a duck's bill. It is the wind trumpet through which the wind god... Enough. The stranger turned to Red Heron. He is the one, Lord Governor. I have your permission, then? But of course, of course, said Red Heron, quite obsequiously. To me, he said, This is the Lord's strong bone, snake woman to Nezehualpili, Ue Tlatawani of Teshkoko. Lord strong bone brings the revered speaker's personal invitation that you come to reside and study and serve at the court of Teshkoko. Teshkoko, I exclaimed. I had never been there, or anywhere in the Akwalhua country. I knew no one there, and no Akwalhuatl could ever have heard of me. Certainly not the revered speaker, Nezahualpili, who, in all these lands, was second in power and prestige only to Tishak, the Ue Tlatawani of Tenochtitlan. I was so astounded that, unthinking and unmannerly, I blurted, Why? You were not commanded, the Teshkoko snake woman said brusquely. You are invited, and you may accept or decline, but you are not invited to question the author. I mumbled an apology, and the Lord Red Heron came to my support, saying, Excuse the youngster, my lord. I am sure he is, as, he is as perplexed as I have been these several years, that such an exalted personage as Nezahualpili should have fixed his regard on this one of so many. Makwehwaltin. The snake woman only grunted, so Red Heron went on. I have never been given any explanation of your master's interest in this particular commoner, and I have refrained from asking. Of course, I remember your previous ruler, that tree of great shade, the wise and kindly Fastin Coyote, and how he used to travel alone throughout the one world, his identity disguised, to seek out estimable persons deserving of his favor. 
Does his illustrious son, Nezahualpili, carry on that same benign avocation? If so, what in the world did he see in our young subject, Telectic Michli? I cannot say, Lord Governor. The haughty noble gave Red Heron almost as gruff a rebuke as he had given me. No one questions the revered speaker's impulses and intentions. Not even I, his snake woman. And I have other duties besides waiting for an irresolute stripling to decide if he will accept the prodigious honor. I return to Teshkoko, young man, at tomorrow's rising of Tezcatlipoca. Do you go with me or not? I go. Of course, my lord, I said. I have only to pack some clothes, some papers, some paints, unless there is something in particular I should bring. I boldly added that, in hope of prying loose a hint of why I was going, for how long I was going. He said only, everything necessary will be provided. Red Heron said, be here at the palace jetty, Michli, at the rising of Tanatiu. Lord Strawn Bone glanced coolly at the governor, then at me, and said, Best you learn, young man, to call the sun god Tezcatlipoca from now on. From now on, forever? I wondered as I hastened home alone. Was I to be an adopted Aquahuatl for the rest of my life, and a convert to the Aquahua gods? When I told my waiting family what had occurred, my father said excitedly, Night wind, just as I told you, son Michli. It was the god Night Wind you met on the road those years ago. And it is from Night Wind that now you will get your heart's desire. Tsitsi looked worried and said, But suppose it is a ruse. Suppose Teshkoko merely happens to need a Shochimikwi of a certain age and size for some particular sacrifice. No, our mother said bluntly. Meechli is not handsome or graceful or virtuous enough to have been specially chosen for any ceremony I know of. She sounded disgruntled at this affair's having got out of her management. But there is certainly something suspicious in all this. Grubbing about in picture books and wallowing idly in the chinampa, Meechli could have done nothing to bring himself to the notice of even a slave dealer, let alone a royal court. I said, From the words spoken at the palace, and from that scrap of writing Lord Strongbone carried, I think I can guess some things. That night at the crossroads, I met no god, but an Aquahuatl traveler, perhaps some courier of Nezahualpili himself. And we have just assumed he was night wind. During the years since then, though I do not know why, Teshkoko has kept track of me. Anyway, it now seems that I am to attend the Teshkoko Kelmakak, where I shall be taught the art of word-knowing. I will be a scribe, as I have always wanted. At least, I finished with a shrug. That is what I surmise. And you call it all coincidence, my father said sternly. It is just as likely, son Michli, that you really did meet Night Wind and took him to be immortal. Gods, like men, can travel in disguise, unrecognized. And you have profited from the encounter. It would do no harm to give thanks to Night Wind. You are right, Father Tepetzalan. I will do so. Whether or not Night Wind was directly involved, he is the dispenser of heart's desires when he chooses to be. 
and it is my heart's desire I am about to realize. But only one of my heart's desires, I said to Sitsi, when, when at last we had a moment together in private. How can I leave the sound of small bells ringing? If you have good sense, you will leave here dancing and cheering, she said, with feminine practicality, but not with any perceptible cheer in her own voice. You cannot spend your life pulling weeds, Beachley, and inventing futile ambitions like your notion of becoming a traitor. However this all happened, you now have a future, a brighter one than has ever been offered to any Makwali of Chantican. But if Night Wind or Nezahuel Pili or whoever could send one opportunity my way, there might be others, even better. I always dreamed of going to Tenochtitlan, not to Teshkoko. I can still decline this offer. Lord Strongbone said so, and I can wait. Why should I not? Because you do have good sense, Mutually. While I was still at the House of Learning Manners, the mistress of the girls told us that Tenochtitlan may be the strong arm of the Triple Alliance, but Teshkoko is the brain. There is more than pomp and power at the court of Nezahualpili. There is a long heritage of poetry and culture and wisdom. The mistress also said that, of all the lands which speak Nahuatl, the people of Texcoco speak the purest form of our language. What better destination for an aspiring scholar? You must go, and you will go. You will study, you will learn, you will excel. And if you truly have won the patronage of the revered speaker, who knows what high plans he may have for you. When you talk of refusing his invitation, you know you talk nonsense. Her voice dropped. And only because of me. Because of us. She sighed. We had to grow up sometime. I always hoped we would do it together. We can still, and always hope. You will be coming home at festival times. We will be together then. And when your schooling is done, why, you could become rich and powerful. You could become Mitchsin, and the noble can marry whomever he chooses. I hope to become an accomplished word-knower, Sitsi. That is ambition enough for me. And few scribes ever do anything to get themselves entitled Zin. Well, perhaps you will be sent to work in some far Akalhua province where it is not known that you have a sister. Simply send, and I will come. Your chosen bride from your native island. That would be years from now, I protested. And you are already approaching marriageable age. In the meantime, the accursed Pactly also comes home for holidays on Shaltakan. Long before my schooling is done, he will be back here to stay. You know what he wants, and what he wants he demands, and what he demands cannot be denied. Denied, no, but possibly deferred, she said. I will do my best to discourage the Lord Joy and he may be less insistent in his demands. She smiled bravely up at me. Now that I shall have a relative and protector at the mightiest court of Teshkoko. You see, you must go. Her smile became tremulous. The gods have arranged that we be parted for a while, so that we shall not be parted forever. The smile faltered and fell and broke, and she wept.
The Lord Strawn Bones Acolyte was of mahogany, richly carved, covered by a fringed awning, decorated with a jade stone badges and feather pennons proclaiming his rank. It bypassed the lakeside city of Texcoco, what you Spaniards now call San Antonio de Padua, and proceeded about one long run farther south, toward a medium-sized hill which rose directly from the lake waters. Texcoco, said the snake woman, the first word he had addressed to me during our entire morning's journey from Chantecan. I squinted to peer at the hill, for on the other side of it was Nezahualpili's country palace. The big canoe slid up to a solidly built jetty. The rowers upended their oars, and the steersman jumped ashore to make the boat fast. I waited for Lord Strong Bone to be helped out by his boatsmen, then myself clambered onto the pier lugging the wicker basket in which I had packed my belongings. The laconic snake woman pointed to a stone staircase winding uphill from the jetty and said, That way, young man. The only other words he spoke to me that day. I hesitated, wondering whether it would be polite to wait for him. But he was supervising his men's unloading from the acolyte, all the gifts Lord Red Heron had sent to the U.A. Tlatawani Nezuhualpili. So I shouldered my basket and trudged alone up the stairs. Some of the steps were man-laid of hewn blocks. Some were carved from the living rock of the hill. At the thirteenth step, I came to a broad stone landing, where there was a bench for resting, and a small statue of some god I could not identify. And the next flight of stairs led off at an angle from that landing. Again thirteen steps, and again a landing. I thus zigzagged up the hill, and then, at the fifty-second step, I found myself on a flat terrace, a vast level place, a vast level place, hacked out of the sloping hillside. It was riotous with the many-hued flowers of a lush garden. That fifty-second step had set me on a stone-flagged pathway, which I followed as it wound leisurely through flower beds, under splendid trees, past meandering brooks and gurgling little waterfalls, until the path again beca became a stairway. Again thirteen steps, and a landing with a bench and statue. The sky had been clouding over for some time, and now the rain came, in the usual manner of the days of our wet season. A storm like the end of the world. Many forked sticks of lightning, drum rolls of thunder, and a deluge of rain as, it would never, as if it would never end. But end it always did, in no longer time than a man would take for a pleasant afternoon nap, in time for Tenatiu or Tezcaltapoca to shine again on a wet sparkling world, to make it steam, to make it dry and warm again before he set. When the rain came now, I had already taken shelter on one of the stair landings, which had a bench protected by a roof thatch. While I set out the storm, I meditated on the numerical significance of the zigzagging staircase, and I smiled at the ingenuity of whoever had designed it. Like you white men, we in these lands lived by a yearly calendar based on the suns traversing the sky. Thus, our solar year like yours, consisted of three hundred sixty and five days, and we used that calendar for all ordinary purposes, to tell us when to plant which seeds, when to expect the rainy season, and so forth. We divided that solar year 
into 18 months of 20 days apiece, plus the Nemontemptin, the lifeless days, the hollow days, the five days required to round out the 360 and five of the year. However, we also observed an alternate calendar based not on the sun's daytime excursions, but on the nightly appearance of the brilliant star we named for our ancient god Quetzalcoatl, or Feathered Serpent. Sometimes Quetzalcoatl served as the afterblossom, which blazed immediately after sunset. At other times, he moved to the other side of the sky, where he would be the last star visible as the sun rose and washed away all the others. Any of our astronomers could explain all this to you, with neat diagrams. But I have never been very good at astronomy. I do know that the movements of the stars are not as random as they would seem, and that our ceremonial calendar was somehow based on the movements of the star named for Quetzalcoatl. That calendar was useful even to our ordinary folk, for naming their newborn children. Our historians and scribes used it for dating notable happenings and the length of our rulers' reigns. More important, our seers used it to divine the future, to warn against impending calamities, to select auspicious days for weighty undertakings. In the divinatory calendar, each year contained 260 days, those days named by appending the numbers 1 through 13 to each of 20 traditional signs, rabbit, reed, knife, and so on. And each solar year was itself named according to the ceremonial number and sign of its first day. As you can perceive, our solar and ritual calendars were forever overlapping each other, one lagging behind or forging ahead of the other. But, if you care to do the arithmetic involved, you will find that they balanced out at an equal number of days over a total of 50 and 2 of the ordinary solar years. The year of my birth was called 13 Rabbit, for example and no later year bore that same name until my 52nd came around. So, to us, 50 and 2 was a significant number. A sheaf of years, we called it, since that many years were simultaneously recognized by both calendars, and since that many years were more or less what the average man could expect to live, barring accident, illness, or war. The stone staircase winding up Teshkotsinko Hill, with its thirteen steps between landings, denoted the thirteen ritual numbers, and with its fifty and two steps between terraces, denoted a sheaf of years. When I eventually got to the top of the hill, I had counted five hundred and twenty steps. Altogether, they denoted two of the ceremonial years of 260 days apiece, and likewise stood for ten sheaves of fifty and two years. Yes, most ingenious. When the rain stopped, I continued my climb. I did not go up all the rest of those stairs in one headlong dash, though I am sure I could have in those days of my young strength. I halted at each remaining landing, only long enough to see if I could identify the god or goddess whose statue stood there. I knew perhaps half of them. Tezcatlipoca, the sun, the chief god of the Akalhua, Quetzalcoatl, of whom I have spoken, Ometecutli, and Omekiatl, our lord and lady pair. I stopped longer in the gardens. There on the mainland, the soil was ample and the space unlimited, and Nizahualpili 
was evidently a man who loved flowers. Flowers everywhere. The hillside gardens were laid out in neat beds, but the terraces were not trammeled by walls. So the flowers spilled generously over the edges, and the trailing varieties dangled their brilliant blooms almost as far down the hill as the next lower terrace. I know I saw every flower I had ever previously seen in my life, besides countless kinds that I never had, and many of those must have been expensively transplanted from far countries. I also gradually realized that the numerous lily ponds, the reflecting pools, the fish ponds, the chuckling brooks and cascades were a watering system fed by the fall of gravity from some source atop the hill. If the Lord Strawn Bone was climbing behind me, I never caught sight of him. But in one of the higher terrace gardens, I came upon another man, lolling on a stone bench. As I approached near enough to see him fairly clearly, the wrinkled, cocoa, nut-brown skin, the ragged loincloth that was his only garment, I remembered having met him before. He stood up, at least to the extent of his hunched and shrunken stature. I had grown taller than he was. I gave him the traditionally polite greeting, but then said, probably more rudely than I intended it to sound, I thought you were a Tautoloco beggar, old man. What do you hear? A homeless man is at home anywhere in the world, he said, as if it were something to be proud of. I am here to welcome you to the land of the Akalhua. You, I exclaimed, for the grotesque little man was even more of an excrescence in that luxuriant garden than he had been in the motley market crowd. That's a little harsh. Were you expecting to be greeted by the revered speaker in person? I asked. He asked, with a mocking, gap-toothed grin. Welcome to the palace of Teshkotsinko, Yon Michli, or Yon Tozani, Yon Malinqui, Yon Poyatla, as you like. Long ago you knew my name. Now you know all my nicknames. A man with a talent for listening can hear even things not yet spoken. You will have still other names in time to come. Are you really a seer then, old man? I asked, unconsciously echoing my father's words of year before. How did you know I was coming here? Ah, you're coming here, he said. I pride myself that I had some small part in arranging that. Then you know a good deal more than I do. I would be grateful for a bit of explanation. Know then that I never saw you before that day in Tlaltaloco, when I overheard the mention that it was your naming day. Out of mere curiosity, I took the opportunity for a closer look at you. When I inspected your eyes, I detected their imminent and increasing loss of distant vision. That affliction is sufficiently uncommon that the distinctive shape of the afflicted eyeball affords an unmistakable sign diagnostic. I could say with certainty that you were fated to see things close and true. You also said I would speak truly of such things. He shrugged. You seemed bright enough for a brat that it was safe to predict you would grow up passably intelligent. A man who is forced by weak eyesight to regard everything in this world at close range, and with good sense, is also usually inclined to describe the world as it really is. You are a cunning old trickster, I said, smiling. But has all that to do with my being summoned to Tashkoko? Every ruler and prince and governor 
is surrounded by servile attendants and self-seeking wise men who will tell him what he wants to hear or what they want him to hear. A man who will tell only the truth is a rarity among courtiers. I believed that you would become such a rarity and that your faculties would be better appreciated at a court rather nobler than that of Champlicain. So I dropped a word here and there. You, I said unbelievingly, have the ear of a man like Nezahualpili? He gave me a look that somehow made me feel again much smaller than he was. I told you long ago, have I not proved it yet, that I also speak true, and to my own detriment, when I could easily pose as an omniscient messenger to the gods. Nezahualpili is not so cynical as you, young mole. He will listen to the lowliest of men, if that man speaks the truth. I apologize, I said, after a moment. I should be thanking you, old man, not doubting you. And I truly am grateful for... He waved that away. I did not do it entirely for you. I usually get full value for my discoveries. Simply see to it that you give faithful service to the U.A. Tlatawani, and we shall both have earned our rewards. Now go. But go where? No one has told me where or to whom I am to announce myself. Do I just cross over this hill and hope to be recognized? Yes. The palace is on the other side, and you are expected. Whether the speaker himself will recognize you next time you meet, I could not say. We have never met. I complained. We cannot possibly know each other. Oh? Well, I advise you to ingratiate yourself with Tolana Tekiapil, the Lady of Tolan, for she is the favorite of Nezahualpili's seven wedded wives. At last count, he also had forty concubines. So over there at the palace, are some sixty sons and fifty daughters of the revered speaker. I doubt that even he knows the latest tally. He may take you to be a forgotten by-blow from one of his wanderings abroad, a son just now come home. But you will be hospitably welcomed, young mole. Never fear. I turned, then turned back again. Could I first be of some service to you, venerable one? Perhaps I could assist you to the top of the hill. He said, I thank you for the kind offer, but I will loiter here yet a while. It is best that you climb and breast the hill alone, for all the rest of your life awaits you on the other side. That sounded pretentious but I saw a small fallacy in it, and I smiled at my own perspicacity. Surely my life awaits, whichever way I go from here, and whether I go alone or not. The Cocoa Man smiled too, but ironically. Yes, at your age, many possible lives await. Go whichever way you choose, Go alone or in company. The companions may walk with you a long way or a little. But at the end of your life, no matter how crowded were its roads and its days, you will have learned what all must learn. And that will be too late for any starting over. Too late for anything but regret. So learn it now. No man has ever yet lived out any life but one, and that one his chosen own, and most of that alone. He paused, and his eyes held mine. Now then, Weechley, which way do you go from here, and in what company? 
I turned and kept on up the hill, alone. And that is the end of part three. If you've made it this far, what's poppin'? It's good to have you here, and I hope you're enjoying yourself. Um, I strongly encourage you to leave a comment down below. Uh, tell me what you think of this audiobook. Is it, uh, I'm curious about how other people will, like, perceive this. I've, I've gotten some good feedback so far, but I, I guess I'm always a little self-conscious, like, is it, I'm not a, I'm not a voice actor by any means, so all the voices are basically the same, I can only do intonations, so I'm wondering if it is easy enough to under, understand what with the same voices and constantly or occasionally messing up words. Yeah, these Aztec words can be pretty hard to pronounce. And like I I could do I could do a pre reading of it so I'm a little more familiar with the content. I mean as I said before I did read this book like a few years ago but um that is not an option that's not a viable option because this book is so long and I cannot allow it to take twice as long as it is currently taking. Just a little progress report here. After all this time, we have just finished page 97. And I, I'm looking at the book here. That is nothing. Let's see uh, how many pages are there. Give me just a second. There's about seven seven hundred fifty four pages i thought i thought it'd be more like a thousand so that's not too bad i guess we're we're actually a seventh of the way through so hey congratulations we've we've made it this far together um yeah pretty good stuff the only thing I wish Gary Jennings would do a little more of is, like, illustrate the passage of time a little more. Because, like, sometimes you won't really be thinking of his age. And you're like, oh, he was, he was a young man earlier. And he is currently a young man. But, um, like, later on, Oh, oh, he's he's a full-grown man now, and I I didn't even really realize it. Like um, multiple years have passed since uh, since we first met Night Wind, or you know the, the courtier guy. And, but that's a very minor problem, because this is this is a very beautiful book. Um, I, rem I remember last time I read this, during the next session, during the next section, there's going to be a lot of history, a lot of like, you know, he's, he's going to school, like literally, it's, that's what it's going to be. So I'm hoping that now that I'm a little more familiar with Gary Jennings and like what he's offering here. Maybe I'll get some more enjoyment out of it this time around. So yeah, hopefully it doesn't just end up being me going through the motions, just reading the words until they're done. I'll try my best. And another thing, I know last time I said I would, uh, I would, I would get this part out as quickly as possible. And it, is, it has been quite some time, and there have been many nights where I did not read, or, I, or I've been reading The Journey on my own. So yeah, I'm just going to be real with you guys. This is a lawn book, and I'm reading another lawn book, and I have, like, a job, and, like, other stuff to do. 
so I'm, I'm definitely going to keep doing this. I, I love all the feedback I've gotten. I love that people actually enjoy this. Apparently. But it's going to take some time. So my goal currently is a minimum of one part a month. And that means that it's going to take me like two years to do this. Which I'm fine with, honestly. But, um, yeah, if possible, I will try to shorten that, put more parts out. But, uh, I, I think the parts are only going to get longer from here. So, we'll see what happens. Just keep in mind, I guess, that I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just a normal man. This is not like a full-time job or anything for me. This is just a passion project. So yeah, thanks for listening if you did, and I'll see you in the comments section. Also, it's it's Halloween and I'm recording this, so happy Halloween. <laughs>